Welcome back to the Pixelist, the podcast about all the nerdy things we love and enjoy. I'm Will. That's Blake. And today we're talking a little triple dub. Uh, <laughs> I can do it. Sure. <laughs> Just testing it out. Uh, today we're talking a little Worlds Beyond Numbers, The Wizard, The Witch, and The Wild One, episode four. Um, the, In the in, Dark? Is that what it's called? In the Drink. In the Drink. In the Drink. There we go. I was close. Yeah. <laughs> Which... I don't really know what the relevance of that name is, given the contents of the episode. I think it's an expression about being in the ocean or something. Okay. I don't know. Okay. I probably just made that up entirely because I was like, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> it works let's for do, me. Let's do the old uh, Google. Um, in yeah. the drink meaning uh, an idiom for being in a body of water. Mm. Oh, well, there we go. Today Another I learned. Pixelist prediction <laughs> lined up. <laughs> Play the air horns. Uh, we got this. Yeah. <laughs> Add it to the list. But so. yeah, today we're we're diving into episode four. Um, I guess is, is, is we. I don't know if we even have anything else to say before we dive in. Do we? Yeah, I guess most of our announcements were yesterday. Um, so yeah, I guess not. Um, we. I haven't talked about it. I don't know if we're going to do a separate video, but um, uh, Critical Role put out a uh, video yesterday with some content updates for them, which I guess we can talk about in another in another video. But basically, just more D and D stuff for us to talk about in general. Yeah. Um, I think it's like tangentially related, just new systems. Um, we talked a while ago about the open D and D and one D and D drama. Uh, and it does, and we talked in that about it seems like there might be creators who create their own systems. It does seem like that's happening. And in fact, we're yeah. seeing it now with the triple dub with, <laughs> um, I guess in a small term, the, the witch subclass. Um, and we still haven't really quite seen like what Brennan's created in terms of like the world he's created and how much he'll deviate from like the standard 5e. But anyway, there's just a little footnote, I think, as an announcement of, you know, yeah. creators are creating stuff. So <laughs> that's right. And uh, we, we did touch on this in our le- most recent critical role video, but in case we've got some, you know, pure worlds beyond number people coming through. Um, if you are a worlds beyond number fan, a Brennan fan, you probably know that there's the new dimension 20 series coming out that uh, Matt Mercer is actually going to be at the helm of uh, Blake and I will be covering that. It'll be our first delve into dimension 20 content. So we'd love for you to, you know, hang out with us on that one as well. And I think it starts in, two or three weeks, something like that. Um, yeah, but, I'm really excited. I've heard a crown of candy mentioned several times for being like one of the most like emotionally compelling yeah. series. Um, and Will and I, by the way, we wanted to go back and watch. We wanted to go back and watch it before the release of this next one. Yeah. But seeing how many episodes it was, we were just like, I, I don't know if it's actually doable. If that changes, we'll let you guys know. But um I think we also talked about maybe doing like some watch parties or something in the discord. Yeah. Which it does. It doesn't seem feasible. There's 20 episodes, I believe. So it doesn't seem feasible to have like 20 watch parties before this new season drops, but I do want to watch it still. So maybe we, maybe we'll start it and maybe we'll, you know, we'll obviously won't finish it, it, but yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Keep an eye on the discord. Um, Again, if you just join the discord in general, if you haven't already, we got a world's beyond number channel there, but also just a good place to chat hang out, talk nerdy things. And uh, yeah, we do do some watch parties. So that interests Mm -hmm. you hop in, keep an eye out there. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, um, But yeah, I think other than that, I think that's that's all I got as far as announcements. Okay. Well, um, what we typically do with long form D and D content, if you're not, haven't checked us out long term, uh, we'd like to do a little recap when the episode starts or whenever we start our episode to talk about, um, what happened in the previous episode just to bring everyone up to speed. Uh, and then we like to cut those recaps out, put it as a separate video for people who want to just see the recap. Uh, so if that's you, hello, and you want to see the whole discussion on the video um, or on the episode, you can check the description and we'll have our breakdown of the episode, including our thoughts, theories, and ideas about what's to come. And we want to know what you think about it too. So make sure you check that out as well. But this was... Um, The Wizard, the Witch, and the Wild One, episode four, uh, in the drink. And we pick up where we left off, which was Captain Endless, seemingly this dark informed, uh, 
encountering something with, um, uh, I keep wanting to say Erica, um, Erica's character, uh, Ame. Uh, Ame. Yeah, Ame. And the encounter opens with combat, essentially. And what we've typically done in the past with Critical Role content is we don't necessarily cover every single detail of content because it can get pretty long-winded. But this combat is going to last a couple of rounds, and some things are going to happen that are pretty devastating from the get-go. First of all, Ame is going to try to convince Captain Emless, like, hey, it's us. Like, what's going on? And there's no response whatsoever. It's pretty clear. Brennan signals like, hey, there's not gonna be you're not gonna talk your way out of this one. So Ame decides to try to basically roll past Captain Emless, takes an attack of opportunity, gets hit, I think, for 10 necrotic damage and four uh strength damage, which was a really or loses four strength basically, which was a really interesting um effect. Uh, so her her strength stat is reduced by four and she immediately goes down unconscious. Uh, so we've been asking, you know, what level are these characters? We find out they are level one. In fact, um, everyone at the table gives Brennan a hard time of like, Brennan, we are level one. <laughs> like just making sure, you know, we're level one. <laughs> and uh, there will be some death saving roles that do happen. Um, she's going to succeed on the first one, fail on the second one. And there is a moment where Captain Inlis has to decide to try to finish off Ame or go for the rest of the group. And fortunately, uh, the fox companion, the familiar, basically kind of covers Ame's body and sort of tries to, um, in very like sad form, is kind of like, wake up, Ame, what's going on? <laughs> and this seems to be enough to deter uh, Captain Inlis from finishing off Ame. Meanwhile, Lou Wilson, Lou Wilson's character is going to um, basically try to close the gap. And as he does so, he's going to throw the broom that he was sparring with in the previous episode, um, argues with Brennan on if he should be proficient with it or not. <laughs> uh, Brennan finally agrees and is able to crack the uh, shadowy creature uh, for quite a bit of damage. The shadowy creature then, it seems to manipulate shadow in general. Uh, something I couldn't tell if it was like, not necessarily like a teleportation, but if it somehow like used the shadow of itself and yeah. like the shadow of the ship to like get over to Lou. Um, don't know if you really tracked exactly what was happening there. But uh, begins fighting um, with Lou's character uh, and then Abria's character is basically um, in both rounds is, hey, she's a wizard. They do damage. That's what they're all about. Uh, basically back-to-back -back magic missiles um, that shoot out like diamonds and uh, essentially defeat this shadowy creature. Uh, as combat ends, um, Lou's character is going to um, do lay on hands. Uh, we do get confirmation that he is a paladin. And brings Ame back up. And they begin to talk about, like, what the heck just happened? Um, there are some details that they discover. One is a tattoo on the captain's neck uh, that I think the language was called Ruvian of the Ruv Empire. Yeah. And um, uh, uh, I can't think of a Bria's character's name. Uh, uh, Suvi. A Su Suvi, yes. Um, Suvi basically knows this language enough from her studies at the Citadel to know that this means chalice. And the implication of it is that um, someone who has gone through some kind of um, ritual to sort of offer themselves up as a vessel to the darkness is the implication. Uh, and upon seeing this, Suvi uh, decides to cut the captain's throat. Despite the fact that the shadowy figure seems to be gone, uh, does so believing that um, if they were to revive the captain, the shadowy creature would return. So just bam, slits the throat. Brutal. So around this time that the rest of the ship uh, crew people come up from the deck below to see them standing over their now bloodied and dead captain. <laughs> and there's very much this immediate tension of like, uh, <laughs> we good? Like, don't kill us too. Yeah. Um, there is an interesting tension between Ame and Suvi on, um, Ame wants to give the captain a proper burial and, and Suvi's like, the burial is the ocean, like throw her overboard and finally relents and says, okay, Ame, do your, do your ritual. Uh, but separately says, you know, never challenge me in front of people again. 
Um, it's a little bit of an interesting struggle there. Mm -hmm. Ami does her ritual, uh, which we assume was what she did with Grandmother Rin, right. and the captain's body is turned to ash, um, uh, which we saw the sort of crematory ashes for um, Grandmother Wren before. Um, we get confirmation from Brennan that this sort of minus strength effect is a bit of a specialty of this type of shadowy creature that is presumed to be for um, defeating witches, especially. And in talking to the crew from this, they basically are like, all right, one of you guys, the captain now. <laughs> and this one uh, older woman steps forward. I think her name was Madge. Yeah, Madge. Or... Captain Madge. <laughs> Ca yeah, now Captain Madge, congratulations. <laughs> and Captain Madge is like, can I get like something official about that? Otherwise, they're going to think like we killed the captain and like took over the ship. And uh, they're like, well, well, we'll deal with it when we get to Port Talon. <laughs> so um, anything I'm missing from this first half, by the way? No, I think you pretty much covered it. Yeah. Well, they continue onwards. And uh, Will, why don't you take the other half of it? Yeah, so... Um, you know, they continue on the journey and basically right before dawn, the ship begins to pull into Port Talon. And there's a lot of nice kind of like world building and little lore mm -hmm. nuggets that Brennan yeah. drops in this sequence here as we're pulling into the town, um, which I'll, I'll touch briefly on, but we might go in more in depth on during our discussion. Right. So. Yeah. They pull into Port Talon, and it's named as such because the way the land extends out into the water, um, it comes to a point at this curve in the sea looking like a Talon. Um, and this is a very large and imposing city, much larger than Joros, which is where we just came from. And it's dominated by like trade buildings. Um, but as they're coming in, they do notice something out in the sea. There is this like yeah. large structure, at least what they think is a structure, but really all they can see are these lights that are out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, Suvi can pick up that they are um, alchemical lights, meaning they're like magic lights created by wizards. But beyond that, she, she doesn't know what this thing is. Um, but as the sun is soon like fully rising, those lights go out. So the lights mm -hmm. are seemingly there in, in like a, to alert ships that there's this structure there. Um, <clears throat> so they're pulling in. There's lots of Imperial ships in the port. Um, and they can see all sorts of flags and stuff. Um, they do see uh, the governor's mansion above which there is a flag of the Azure Battalion, which are soldiers of the Imperium itself. And they are not wizards per se, but they do have access to some spells. Basically, the way Brandon described it is they can wield the engine of spellcraft produced by wizards. Um, there is a wizard's spire as well, but um, on that there is the symbol of the Imperium. Um, so these are wizards of the crown. Um, <clears throat> something else the team notices as they're coming in is there is tons of smoke, which Ame identifies as salt fire, yeah. um, which is something witches use, and I'm assuming other people use as well, but to dispel abjurative magic. Uh, but there is a ton of it, like so much so that it's making Ursulon queasy and Ame has yeah. never seen anything like this before. And Ursulon says it was not like this the last time I was here. Um, so right before they depart the ship, though, um, Suvi writes her little letter of official recommendation or whatever you want to call it to give to the newly captained Madge. Um, just to kind of explain what happened so that they don't think the you know crew just mutinied and, and killed Imlis. Um, so she gives her that. And then she also takes her little lapel pin that she has and she flips it upside down and repins it to her shirt, um, which she says signifies that she has spilled blood in defense of the empire. And she seems kind of like proud of this fact. Um, yeah. so the crew steps out into Port Talon and Ursulon basically begins taking them to where he last saw Finley, the hedge mage that they are looking for to retrieve the sword from. Um, as they're traveling, Ame asks, like, hey, you know, how did you lose the sword to begin with? And Ursulan is kind of, like, ashamed and embarrassed about sharing, like, these parts of his life where, you know, he really didn't reach up to the standard he has set for himself. <clears throat> and that is kind of, they can kind of feel that from him. But he explains that he lost the sword because Finley, this hedge mage, discovered him and found out his secret. Um, that secret being that, you know, he is a wild one and kind of right. lives in, in his glamour and keeps that away from people. Uh, so Finley found this out and basically blackmailed him. And so Ursulon gave him the sword so that he would keep his secret. Right. Um, 
And of course this riles up Ami and Suvi and they're like, Oh, well, we're going to take care of this. And uh, <laughs> so they make their way and they eventually come to this door <clears throat> and you might have to correct me on the exact details here, but one thing as they're making their way to this door, Brennan describes this like massive wall. And I can't tell if the wall is like, if they are not inside the wall or if they are inside the wall and they're just seeing the, I don't know, because I was actually hyper-focused on, it's like a large black door that they're going up to. And so I was like, really like, yeah, trying to figure I, out like, is there a detail there? So I, I I missed the rest of that, unfortunately. Okay, yeah. So you guys let us know in the comments if you have more specifics here. But Brennan describes this massive wall that is like far taller than even the tallest building in this city. And I think the salt fire smoke is coming from the other yes. side of it. Oh, okay. I actually thought it was like from like the ramparts of the wall. Um, oh, okay. Which, yeah. So, so I don't know which one it is actually. If it's yeah, behind not, the wall, or if it's like this, these ramparts of the wall. Oh yeah. I'm not, I'm not highly confident, but essentially there's a massive wall and it is a conjured wall, which means that like a bunch of wizards got together and, and created this wall with spellcraft. Um, but it's not too important in the immediate scene here because again, they've come to this door and this is where, you know, Ursuline last saw Finley. And so they knock on the door. Um, as soon as they do, they hear like a commotion inside and then some glass shattering and then nothing. And so Ursuline starts like yelling for like Finley um, to let me in. And uh, <clears throat> there's again, there's no response. And so Ami is about to seemingly cast some sort of spell um, when Suvi just checks the handle and the door is yeah. open. So yeah. she just opens it um, inside this um, chamber is just a bunch of like odds and ends. Uh, Brennan described it like a rotting museum turned pawn shop. And in the center is there uh, is a man wearing this patchwork cloak and a wizard's hat. And his mouth is open in horror with a slit throat. Uh, Ursulon recognizes this as Finley. And then um, they can tell that that glass shattering was from this window in the room that is now obviously broken. And they realize someone has just made their escape. And that is where the episode ends. Um, once again, episode four of The Wizard, the Witch, and the Wild One in the drink. And um, if you're on the recap video and you want to see our full discussion, a reminder that it will be linked down in the description box below. Woohoo! Okay. All righty, man. <clears throat> Lots to, dis to discuss. Yeah, um, yeah. But, you know, let's get it out of the way real quick. What'd you think? It's great. Loved it. Yeah, it's fun. I'm continuing to really enjoy the audio style of it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what it is about it, but I actually don't really even think much about it anymore. Um, from episode one, I was like, really like, okay, this is different. This is this is, and now I I literally like I lock in and don't even really think about the fact that I'm just only listening. Yeah, same here. Um, it did catch me off guard in the first episode, just like you said, but now I'm I'm fully in tune with it. Um. And I, re I really like it too. Um, yeah. You know, again, Taylor, we've we mentioned a few times the, the producer and the one who, I don't know if he does a hundred percent of it, so I don't want to mm. misspeak, but he does the lion's share at least of the production work. Um, absolutely fantastic job. It really is. Yeah. Uh, since it is audio only the little sound effects and stuff he does really do like amp up the immersion. Um, yeah. Yeah. They really do. So yeah. yeah. And uh, also really enjoyed the episode. Um, you know, I, I'll probably be able to say this every week. So at some point, I guess I'll just, you know, just not say it and people will know, but again, it's just, it's so short compared to what you and I are used to coming from critical role and being, you know, two weeks between each episode on top of that, that yeah. I'm just always left, you know, wanting more, which, which is a good thing, but, um, you know, it's almost yeah. just a, a tease kind of, Sorry. Uh, the uh, spring allergies has like my eye permanently Bro, itching. Um, same man. There's Paul. I yeah. went outside today and they're pollen like all over my car. Yeah. And I was like, I don't yeah, even want to go. Anymore. Like, yeah. When you see like as a layer on your car, you're just like awesome. <laughs> yeah. The, um, I guess this one was like an hour and a half, something like that. Yeah. It's, it's weird. Cause I'm so trained to watch four hours of content, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I kind of like it though. It's, it's a weird dynamic, honestly. Cause, and maybe it's like the phase of life I'm in right now. Cause I think in a different phase, I'd be really frustrated by one, the length of episode and how it's every other week mm -hmm. as opposed to weekly. I wish it was weekly. 
Um, but yeah, once I would listen to it, I'm like, I turn my brain off, I guess. And I go on to like the next piece of content. So it, it's very palatable in that way. Yeah. I really like it in that way. But I, I think this will probably just be forever that I'm like, man, I wish there was more. I wish it yeah. was longer and I wish there was more. Um, I do wonder if every other week, if eventually they'll fill the off week with something else, like another show. Well, um, they already, they already are in the, did we talk about this already in the, uh, I think well, we did. I think, well, I, just to make sure you know what I'm about to say, they already are in the sense of the fireside chats, which I don't know if that's what you were about to refer to or not. No, I wasn't cool. Cause those things aren't they're through the Patreon, but they are getting together. Right. Obviously. I mean, like from a produced standpoint, um, which we talked before right. about if there was another show they were working on, or if that was just, uh, the guy who, uh, we just mentioned, uh, Taylor, Taylor, like Taylor Moore, I think something, uh, otherwise, but, um, they are notating their episodes with WWW. Like this is a, which, you know, wizard, the witch and the wild one episode. So, yeah. um, I don't know. I, I, I do wonder if we're keeping the space open to put in other content. Yeah. I, I think so. Um, you know, uh, I think they, they've made it clear that this, this wizard, the WWW campaign is going to be a long one, like multiple years. So I would find it hard to believe that they don't ever release something else concurrently with it. Um, you know, maybe it's like a quote unquote one shot for lack of a better term, even if that still takes place over like a few weeks worth of episodes or whatever. But I, I could see them doing that. And I'm still a bit unclear on just the behind the scenes, like logistics. Are they getting together? Because we talked about this. Is this like batch recording and then they like splice it up and like now it's gonna be episode four um because we talked about it earlier and then it was like well no on that next episode they said hey we, we're coming back to the next episode this one picked right up from where the previous one ended and i thought maybe they just cut it in half but then there's a moment where lou says like brennan it's episode four like this is episode four yeah um, so I'm, I'm real curious about just the mechanics of the recording is totally indifferent to my experience, I guess. Right. But it's, it's um, interesting. Um, yeah, I'm curious. I think there's certainly batch. Or I, I know for a fact, at least some of them were batched because um, I don't remember where I heard it. I assume it was in the children's adventure, but they went on, they called it like a camp to do the children's adventure. And I think some of the very first episodes where they, um, you know, I don't know the details obviously, but yeah. they essentially went and like all stayed in, like a cabin or whatever it may have been. And I think oh, cool. mass recorded the children's adventure, but Lou made some comment that was like when we were at camp and did the children's adventure and also like the very, very start of the campaign. So I don't know if that means like just episode mm. one or maybe you yeah, know, okay. first two, but in any case, they at least did a batch recording then, but it make it only makes sense. Like logistically they're all, you know, they all have other careers and very right. successful ones at that outside of what, this thing that they're doing. So it would only make sense to be like, all right, we all have like six hours today. Let's churn out five episodes with the link they do and you well, know, just mean, get it so chopped up. Specifically Abria doing, um, Abria doing critical role weekly, um, for several weeks, uh, yeah. also doing the dimension 20, series which seems to have already been recorded yeah based on the promo um so yeah they are handling a multitude of projects for sure mm -hmm. so i yeah i can see it happening but so yeah i it is that comment though when he said you know it's episode four that is interesting so i wonder if they have like like even if they're like recording let's just for sake of argument five episodes at once i wonder if there's like a discussion at the table of like okay that's a good place to break like that'll be an episode break um, or it just coincidentally ended up being, you know, a new recording for them that happened to be the fourth one. Um, yeah. But yeah, it, it is interesting to think about. And I, I would imagine they would probably answer that question. I don't think they would be cagey about it, especially with the context clues we've already been talking about. Um, so maybe we should throw that question on the Patreon or something. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm okay. curious. Um, well, let's, talk about the actual episode um lots of really good lore bombs in this one yeah um i was unclear 
the the Ruvian Empire, if that was within the the not the Dominion because the Dominion actually what did they say was part of the Dominion because isn't the Dominion one of the opponent opposing entities? I think so. I think so because there was just some statement that that like listed two advers adversarial things at least in the context of the conversation that was being held and it was like Dominion and something else. Yeah, or maybe that it was not like the Dominion, but it was, I don't know. And it's tough because these episodes, there's no like notes online, like a recap notes. So yeah. like, it's like once I got it, I either got it or I don't got it. Um, yeah, dude. Well, before I forget, this is an idea I had that I did forget. And you're reminding me of it in the moment. We should get like a Google Doc going of like a like a world yeah. building doc. And we could even yeah. we could even get like for those of you that are listening could help us contribute to this and we could get like a, a master. Oh, that's a great idea. A master yeah. thing going. Um, cause yeah. Yeah. Was, yeah. I was just I've just got a scattered section. notes. I was just saying maybe there's a section, like a glossary of like, here's like entities and areas. And, yeah. And we could like um, put together like a map from what we know too. Yeah. Cause there's, yeah, the Ruvian empire, um, I think was the phrasing. Um, or maybe it was just from Ruve. Maybe that's yeah, what it was. I think um, both were mentioned. Like Ruve, like the language you recognize is Ruve. Right. And then like yeah. one of the sailors like spoke in Ruvian, I think. Yes, that's right. Yes. Um, all that to say, though, I love that little detail of like the chalice. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm really, I love how the players are so quick to jump on Brennan's details. Like I, I, I do think some of it's like discussed beforehand in terms of like, um, like maybe Brennan and Abria sit down in the session zero. Let's talk about like your dynamic with the Citadel, like some small, tiny details. And maybe there's enough there that Brennan mentions that Abria's like, Oh, I know what he's talking about. Yes. Um, but I think a lot of it is Brennan gives a small detail and the players run with it basically. Yeah. Um, and, and I think Brennan helps with that, where, where he says, like, hey, and you would know this from your backstory or your background. But um, it feels like there are details, too, where Brennan gives just a little bit and the player's like, yeah, and I, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, we hate chalice bearers, or <laughs> <laughs> which clearly she does. So, yeah. Um, but, yeah, you just yeah. slit in the lady's throat, man, just bam. Yeah, it that that yeah so much to unpack in just in just that moment and yeah you're absolutely right I, I would imagine that you know similar to any campaign that there is when you're flexing out the backstory if you will there's some conversation that'll happen with the dm so you know you know um but yeah uh sorry i lost my train of thought but so yeah this this chalice which again written in in ruvian um right. i know we just discussed that but have to your knowledge, has there been a, a, a Ruve or a Ruvian mentioned before this mention of the language? I think this is the first time. Okay, um, that, that's what I thought too, but I couldn't remember. Yeah, which, which, that's why I say like there's some discussion because I, I, Bria, I, I mean, it could have just been very high level intelligence moment of Bria being like, oh, right, but I'm assuming maybe there was a conversation on like, here's like a couple of other continents or areas or empires for Abria to immediately be like, yeah, Ruvian. Oh man. Yeah. Well, she um, speaks it. Right. You know? Yes. So like, it's one of her right. languages that she knows. Right. Um, yes. Uh, and the, um, the sailors spoke it or at least some of them. One, yeah. I so think that, one did. so that at least means to me that it's not like a, like an empire necessarily, you know, it's, it's just a, yeah. a region of the world more likely. Yeah. Um, but yeah, okay, let's unpack this chalice thing a little bit. So there's this symbol that mm -hmm. then makes you a vessel, and it's like an right. honor to be able, like it bestows you status to to be a chalice. And so like, because of that, then clearly Imlis was like, she wasn't just an innocent bystander to this circumstance. Like she was... I don't know if it's fair to call her evil because we don't really know like what the, the delineations are on. I mean, I guess it is the, the shadow thing did not look like a, a good guy, but like, you know, I, I mean, maybe I don't know. I, I don't know if it makes sense.
for Emlis to be this evil character because the the placing of it doesn't make sense. Right. Like, she's on this dinky ship, this backwaters crew. The impression I got was like when someone gets out of prison and they have like tattoos from mm. being in prison and like when they were in prison, it meant a lot, like it created status for them. But now they're, you know, they're a grocery store clerk, um, you know, working behind the counter and they're tatted up. And obviously it's not for the grocery store. It's, <laughs> you know, they're just making money however they want to make money. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, I got kind of the same impression that that maybe Imlis in a younger in younger days pursued some questionable things and you know, here she is just trying to make ends meet and maybe even forgetting about the chalice and, um, you know, the shadow we get, we have a witch on a ship who's isolated, um, clearly targeting Ame. Um, what do you know? Here's a, here's a chalice that I can take over. Um, I'm not saying it has to be that it could be what you're saying. Um, but that was kind of the, where my imagination ran with, I guess. Yeah, well, I, I'm torn on it because before the whole chalice thing, it seemed like Imlis was just a kind of wrong place, wrong time to get possessed by this thing that wanted to to take out Ame or whatever. But I don't know the fact that the tattoo like bestows status, or I, I'm I'm paraphrasing, but there was something mentioned. It was like an it was like an honor to be a chalice or something like that. Yeah, I mean, who hasn't gotten a tattoo though to like fit in with a cult that you were like really big on, and yeah, then like I you mean, know. True. Like, I got the tattoo, and then like 15 years later, you're like, dude, that was a cult. Like, what was I doing? <laughs> you know, I mean, well, I don't know. No, to your, I'm not, I'm not trying to like come <laughs> at you strong from the other side because I really don't know. And to your point, they did make it clear that like Imlis was like scared and didn't really like. It gave the impression that she was scared and like didn't really know what was happening, right? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, it did seem like she was now blameless isn't the right word but like the the spirit had left the shadow had left and you know it's just her now um yeah. which i mean again maybe it's like a yeah you might sign up for this thing like i'm gonna be a vessel and then once it actually happens you might be like oh like what have i done so like that yeah. that is also possible but it did just seem like i don't know like the and not not to dig too deep into this it's since it's episode four, we're at the very beginning. This was the first real combat of the show. Like maybe that, maybe this was just a nice way, nice pieces were lined up. To, you know, maybe it's not, maybe it's not too much deeper than that to un- to unpack. But right. um, it is curious that like, you know, there just so happened to be a chalice on this boat that they hired. And um, see, that's that's also why it feels more like my theory, and if not even my theory. Like in the Matrix, like there are certain, I mean, it's pretty much everybody, right? The agents can just take possession of someone yeah, um, for their own means. And so I fully believe Captain Endless um, may not have had any, I think it's maybe a couple of things. Maybe had no insight whatsoever to, as to what was going to happen. Or maybe there was something more nefarious there and that she has that tattoo. Maybe he's forgotten about it. You know, he's running this ship. Um, clearly has a job, a witch gets on the ship and, you know, she pulls her earlobe. Hey, I got, you know, I got something here. Like maybe sees an opportunity Mm -hmm. to make a lot of money and, you know, I don't know what the mechanics of that would be, but who knows? And maybe doesn't realize like she's almost sort of dooming herself like to possession of this creature. Um, I don't know. Yeah. a, A lot of, a lot of interesting questions from this because if if not what you're saying then like what force is at play here that it just knew you know like how did the shadow yeah. know to possess her at that moment um if Imlis didn't you know if she didn't have a more active role and what what came of it um i mean honestly we could speculate here all day so i don't want to get too drug out on it but very interesting. One of many like really cool world building moments that just opens up so many further questions. Um, and this, this goes without saying for everything we're going to talk about, but definitely those of you watching in the comments, let us, let us know your thoughts on exactly what was shaken out here. And how bold of Brennan to have them start at level one. 
Um, I did yes. not expect. We talked about this. We were like, "What level are they?" We have no idea. I did not expect Ame to go down instantly, and I, I don't think she expected it either. Um, no, I don't think any of them did. It was so the, hilarious. The strength draining mechanic, yeah, was also unique and interesting. Um, yeah, so I think, and obviously, the same thing is true of Critical Role for those of you that that aren't familiar with with us from that or are not familiar with that Matt will oftentimes like start with a standard 5e creature, but then he might tweak it or homebrew it for his own needs. And um, I'm sure Brennan does the same thing, but the shadow really uh, does sound like a 5e shadow um, because their attacks oh, siphon okay. strength in the same way, um, uh, <clears throat> which if, if, if from that attack you are brought to zero strength, you die. Um, and so I don't I don't know how much strength Ame has, but that first attack like siphoned four. So yeah. you know, I can't imagine she has like too too much more than than I mean she has more than four, obviously, but she must not have too much more than that as a level one spellcaster, essentially. Bro, this might be straight out of 5e. I mean, like exactly as you said. I mean, this um You yeah, know, I mean, 16, it, it, 16 hit points. Um, its attack is a 2d6 plus two. Um, we saw 10 damage and we saw eight points of damage. Uh, and then strength score is reduced by 1d4. We had four with Ame and then two with Ursulon. Um, yeah, that's pretty interesting to me. Um, oh, and then if, if, um, uh, oh, actually, never mind on that one, but okay. Yeah, anyway, I just think that's a really great pickup. I didn't realize that. Um, it does seem like that might be the case. Yeah. So it's just super interesting all around. And it was cool that we, um, so one thing we had speculated about in our earlier episodes is what combat was going to look like on this show. Uh, mm. when we got our first taste of it and it was pretty much completely normal. Um, we, uh, for, for if, just to catch you up on what we were even wondering about is with this, this, um, this format, this produced format, might there be a more truncated version of combat combat or would it, you know, what would it look like at all? But we now know. Um, and it seems like they didn't really cut anything out. I mean, there might be some like cross table discussion as far, like if they were figuring out their turns or something like that, that maybe got cut out and we would never know, but I'm glad they at least left some of that in, which I'm glad they did of them. Like, you know, all <laughs> chastising Brennan for, throwing this thing at them when they're level one. Um, I'm assuming they cut out like just the dead time. Um, Cause like calling for roles, things like that. The answer was always immediate. It wasn't like, Oh, right. uh, which, which dice is it again? Is this, Oh, Oh darn. Um, hey, do you have another D six, right? Like <laughs> it just was like, boom, got it. Um, yeah. So, and it kept combat moving for me, which I really like. Um, Cause it can be a big momentum killer when, <laughs> It's like, okay, what are you doing? Yeah. Uh, no, that just uh, for, yeah. Yeah. For sure. Uh I am glad. I mean, I guess I don't know what it could have been because we got what we got, but I'm glad we got what we got. Um yeah. I uh I like that we kind of get to see the bot the, the 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 mechanics of what everybody's doing and uh we still do get some of that meta discussion as well, um, which I was hoping for. Um but so uh, go ahead. You go ran, ahead. random quick aside because we were talking about the cutting things out is in the most recent fireside chat um they did reveal i, I don't remember wh how the conversation got there but they were talking about things getting cut out and somebody said like have you guys noticed anything that like got cut out that you like you're like oh you know what happened to that and basically everyone was like, no, I don't, I don't think so. Everything's pretty much been left in aside from the things we were just talking about of like random, right. you know, not important things. But one thing that's really interesting is that Suvi or Abria said that there was something cut out in the, um, I think it would have been in the first episode. She apparently goes and uh, hooks up with silver that, you know, that mage oh. that was getting like ceremoniously oh. um, awarded. Oh, yeah. I thought you were talking about stone, and I was like, well, that's an odd dynamic because it was very maternal. <laughs> it's, probably, it's probably good they cut that out. <laughs> yeah. It's getting weird. 
But no, nice. yeah, Silver, that, okay. that younger mage that was getting awarded after returning home or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah, apparently she goes and hooks up with him before going through the portal door or whatever. Um, yeah, okay. Which just made me really curious about, like, why they would cut that out. Like, it doesn't seem like that's something that will... Maybe they do, like, flashbacks or something and we eventually get that scene. Uh, maybe it just brought nothing to the table and so they're like, well, let's lose that. Um, I mean, it could have been one of those things where um, the show, I call it a show, it's its produced. Um, and it could have been one of those things where, like, it's just something goofy happening where when you when you listen to it, it's like, this was kind of everywhere. <laughs> like, hard to kind of parse even what was happening. It was very distracting is not the right word, but just like, it's like those moments when you're at a table where, like, something's trying to happen but there's so much like chatter or banter that it's just a very kind of chaotic a moment that isn't chaotic feels chaotic yeah could have been something like that um it could have been like you said it could have been maybe it's going to come back as a flashback which i actually kind of like i think it's kind of neat um or it could be maybe for whatever reason they were just like hey we want to be a little intentional pacing of the show and this is this kind of goes out to left field so um and she could be being half honest isn't the right word. It could have even been, I didn't see this comment, but it could have been at her request. She could have been after it happened, been like, hey, actually, this kind of detracts where I want to take the character or I want to have that moment later on. So can we just pretend like it didn't happen? Hmm. Um, which I have obviously no idea, but some yeah. guesses for me, I guess. It's just, it's just interesting that that's on the table at all, though, um, kind of regardless yeah, of the true. reason. It makes me wonder, um, I don't know, it just, it, it, I guess it just goes to show like they are putting a lot of intentionality and thought into how these are not only cut in terms of like where one episode ends and one begins, but just yeah. everything about them is being considered, um, which is honestly a good thing. Um, but, you know, uh, the, I don't know if... if I don't know the right word, but I guess especially coming from Critical Role where you do get to see everything unfiltered, part of me is like, oh, well, I wonder what happened in that scene, you know? Um, yeah. But, you know, yeah. I'm sure they've got a good reason for it. Uh, but I was just thought that was really interesting when I found that out. Um, Speaking of Suvi, I want to talk about her dynamic a bit after the combat yeah. scene. We get a very cold side of her. Um, and being childhood friends with Ame, we get our first sort of instance of tension. Mm -hmm. Um, Ame, I forgot to mention this in the recap, but Ame really tries to console her. Like, Hey, we just killed someone. You, I mean, you, you just killed someone. (laughs) Are you, are you okay? And she's like, I'm fine. And Ame, I love that Erica did this, pressed it and said like, no, you're not. <laughs> and um, Suvi is like, you know, don't pre- very um, thorny is how I would describe it. Don't presume to know how I feel. You have no idea. Um, and then is very challenging with um, never, never challenge me again or never disagree with me. Yeah. In front of people, which just, I mean, very intense mm-hmm. to say to someone in general. Um I don't know. What's your take on all of that? What a what a line. Um I I was fascinated by that. I thought that was such a cool character choice. Um Subi is a really interesting. Um <clears throat> I I think it I think it, it one line showed a lot of depth to her character, especially combined with other things we've seen. Um I think it was I I think it was the previous episode where they where they had their spa, their duel or spar or whatever Ursulan and Subi and there's some comment made about like this was the first like fun Suvi's had since the summer they were together as children. Right. So clearly, you know, she's had this like militant kind of lonely, you know, life. And I think that leading up to this moment now where she says that it kind of just expresses that like she's had to basically become this like stone cold killer. Uh, we know the Citadel. We don't really know the political landscape of the world right now, but clearly the Citadel is a major power player um, that clearly has enemies. And she is 
I don't know if indoctrinated is, is fair to say. I mean, I guess it is, whether it's a good or bad indoctrination. Um, but she's clearly been indoctrinated by this facility mm. and um, is like one of its prized pupils, as we know, the youngest, you know, right. arc mage apprentice ever. Right. Um, so, you know, it only makes sense that she would be bought in hardcore to what they believe. And so, you know, yeah. she sees that symbol. It's like, well, oh, it's like they can't stay. Um, Which so- is a nice little detail to Grandmother Ren's advice to Ame of, hey, you're going to want to get her permission to share some of these things with her. If, mm. if things line up like we've talked about, the hidden information, if that is if it detracts from the credibility of the Citadel, like you just said, if she's totally bought in, yeah, um, that, might be, that might be challenging for her. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's her, it's her whole life, right? I mean, it's literally right. been her whole life and her parents are gone and they were also kind of like, yeah, star pupils in their own right. So she probably is like trying to, to be like them. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that I think that said a lot. It got me really excited for the dynamics moving forward. But yeah, great point on the friction that could be there. Um, yeah, I I don't want to take anything away from Abria and imply that it, none, none of this was intentional. Um, um, the implication I got, uh, and what I, I mean that meaning, I don't know how much I'm reaching when I say this, or if if it was intentional or not. The implication I got was, you know, we've known that Suvi's been looking for an opportunity to prove herself. Um, she has said as much of like, you know, like, put me in, coach. Like, come on, like, let me, let me get out there. And so I wonder if, like you said, like her training sort of took over and it was like, it's like, okay, this person is a chalice bearer. Um, like, I know what I need to do. This is what needs to happen. And as she, even to the point of like getting, getting threatened by Ame, of like, don't challenge me in front of people. Like a very, I don't say out of character, um, but a a surprise reaction from what we've seen so far. To me, almost like, you know, kind of going through, not going through the motions, but like, this is what a person of the Citadel does. Like we make hard decisions. We do this, like sort of checking the boxes. Um, I think of it as like someone who's like, you know, a college grad or like is in the real world for the first time. They've already stepped like into a manager role. And it's like, this is what a manager does. And like the first time they have tension, it's like, I'm the boss. Like, you know, and again, not saying she was necessarily doing that, but I, I just got vibes of I'm here. I'm here to prove something even to the point of intentionally like flipping the lapel pin, which I thought was such, yeah, such a great, that, that's actually an example of, I doubt Brennan. I mean, I don't know. He could have, I don't know if Brennan was like, Hey, and then, you know, when, when a person finally kills someone, they flip the lapel. I mean, I don't know. But I just love that detail, um, and it just reeks of um, hail corporate, <laughs> just like <laughs> you know, advancing herself. And anyway, I think that will be an interesting theme that Abria is aware of, and I'm excited to see her lean into her personal clout versus her friendship with Ame and Ursalon. Yeah, yeah, I'm a hundred percent with you, and. Just what a cool, like, this is the start of a campaign, um, you know, above table. So let me finish my thought, I guess. So we, it's that, but also, you know, in, in terms of in world, these characters, this is, she's just run into her friends that she hasn't seen in whoever knows how many years, her only friends probably. Um, so you would think it would be like kind of happy, joyous time. We're going on this adventure together. I'm finally back with my friends. Like you think that would be the dynamic. So it's just so cool. And like, I think such a great storytelling move to make, to introduce, no, this dynamic of like, no, like, you know, you are under the pecking order of my duty at the Citadel. Like, don't not ever contradict me in front of these people. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I just thought that was such a cool character choice and such a cool dynamic to introduce this early in the campaign of like, no, you know, we're not just, you just cause we're the party of the good guys adventuring together. We're not like honky dory. Like there's some, yeah. potential friction here already yeah and well, or, um one last quick thing it's not really it's not spoilery in that there was nothing spoiled but this is something lou said during the fireside chat i know that doesn't give you like any context at all but 
Would you prefer me not yeah. to say it? No, go ahead. Okay. I mean, yes, <clears throat> say it. <laughs> so something again, I don't I don't remember what brought us up to this moment in the uh in the conversation, but they were talking about, you know, with three people, and this is the phrasing they used, sometimes there's a pair and a spare, meaning like two of the three are really good friends and the third one's kind of the third wheel. Um and they were like, you know, what's the dynamic there since there's three of us like this? And something Lou said that interested me was, well, looking back, because, you know, clearly they've pre-recorded X amount of episodes. He said, looking back to episode four, where we are here, um, he's like, and I don't really think that's fair to say, but like knowing what we know now, he was like, yeah. So clearly some dynamic, Ooh. at least partially develops where two of the two of them are going to be maybe a bit closer with one being ostracized. And I think clearly the, the smart guess there would be that it's Suvi if she continue, like, you know, if she yeah. continues to prioritize yeah. this other stuff. Yeah. Um, so I just thought that was really interesting and kind of fit into yeah. what we were talking about here. Well, just in the interest of time, let's, let's move along this episode. Um, we have the funeral, right? That happens, which I just, yeah. just thought was a nice confirmation that there's something um, that Ame, which is in general, seem responsible for. Um, the entry into Port Talon. I'm really interested in the thing in the in the sea. I kind yeah. of envision like a an oil rig you almost like can't see or something. Um, yeah. The thing in the distance, and then the salt fires and the wall were yeah. all very. It's like what's happening here exactly? Like what's going on here? Um, yeah. I was actually more interested in those things than I was Finley's throat being cut. Um, yeah, same. Maybe there's more to that, but clearly Finley is kind of a not a great guy. So I imagine maybe his throat just is slit because of other, you know, underhanded things he had going on. Um, Probably fell and tripped. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm with you on those. That the whole sequence of of coming into the town and getting all those details was really interesting. Um, I real quick before we dive into the two things you brought up, I was just going to, we can maybe sort this out on our Google doc if we make it, but parse the quick things we got here. There's the Azor battalion, yeah, which was of the Imperium, which I think, I think Imperium is just, is there's so many that's, names here. Is that just the, the, the empire that's, that's, that they are? Yeah, That's the Citadel's okay. organization. I think. Which Brennan described them basically as, as in terms of mechanics, fighters with the magic initiate feet. Yes, exactly. Yes. I thought that was really cool. For those of you that don't know, the magic yeah. initiate feat is like a feat you can take in D and D that basically gives you access to a couple of cantrips and a level one spell from a from mm -hmm. another class. Um, so I thought that was cool. So we have we have that flag was on the governor's mansion. So like the citadel, the imperium. Are, are the muscle for the political structure of the world. But then we had the wizard spire that had, uh, I'm not looking at the name right now, but it had a different thing on it, which was wizards of the crown as Brennan described it. So there's, so the, the wizards for the royalty are a separate faction from the normal Citadel wizards. I'm wondering do those wizards still train at the Citadel and then they become wizards of the crown? And then there's like this delineation yeah. or like, is there another school out there? Right. That, um, obviously we don't have the answers to these things, but I just thought this was really curious. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I don't know. I don't, and I don't even don't even know what to say about it. Other than it's, it is fun to piece these things together though and be like, okay, I see yeah. where this is. Going. Or not even, I see where I don't, I don't know where it's going, but just kind of like, me creating the mind map, I guess, yeah. of all these entities, um, which Britain clearly has it all fleshed out in his mind. Well, at least to a degree more yeah, than at least, do. at um, least enough. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, just quickly wanted to kind of help mind map that out, but yeah. The, okay. The structure in the sea, obviously we don't know what it is, but my mind jumped to, um, like a prison, like kind of like Alcatraz. -y, yeah. yeah. Or at least some, it, or just some sort of like facility, I guess, for lack of a better word, where like did, maybe experiments are going down or I don't Ursula, know. When Ursula said this wasn't here before, he was talking about the salt fires, right? Yeah, I think so. Okay. But didn't, 
Lou didn't comment on the thing in the ocean, right? Or did he? I don't think he did. I think it was mainly mainly Subi. Yeah, okay. Um because I think Subi even asked like what I know what that is or something. And she, maybe she did like a check and it was like too loud. Right? Yeah, like, that, that's you know? what happened. She rolled and she basically just knew that the lights were like wizard lights, essentially. Yeah. It didn't seem to be. I mean, clearly it has lights signaling people. So it didn't seem to be like a secret or anything that was hidden. Right. Um, I like but, the kind of Architraz uh, or sorry. That's wow. Um, <laughs> Alcatraz, Alcatraz. Yeah. Type theory. Um, I don't know. Something weird's happening in the city. Like mm-hmm. the salt fire was such a um, fully worded thing, and yet it was one of the most compelling things to me. I was just like the fact yeah. that it's used for like uh, dispelling. Yeah, it, it almost felt like to me like they were trying to ward something off in some way, like something had happened to the city. Yeah. Almost like ritualistically trying to like cleanse the city in some way. I wasn't really clear, but yeah, I got that vibe too. Cause like the example he gave was like, if there was a curse in your garden, you would like salt yes. fire it out. Yes. Um, right. That's why I thought of that was like, is what's happened to Port Talon exactly? Yeah. Um, the fact that it needs this massive amount of them. Um, mm-hmm. I don't even know like where to begin speculating there, but it's certainly an interesting mystery box, which I have to imagine the little, the storyline here is going to lead to it yeah. in some way. Um, yeah. Yeah. I also wonder if, if the wall is related at all either. And I, I don't think anyone commented on it, so we don't know, but we knew the wall was, was conjured. Yeah. So I'm wondering if the wall was there last time Ursulon was was there or not, or if, if that's new. And if they're related to isolate a part of the city where maybe there's a disease or something. I mean, I it did know. seem that way because he talked about how tall it was. Yeah. You know, like, why do you need a wall that tall? Yeah. It's <laughs> the story of my life, you know? <laughs> I don't know. Um, well, I guess we're not going to meet Finley. <laughs> yeah, I guess not, unfortunately. I do wonder if, I mean, I'm a probably is going to do like the funeral rites for them. Uh, you know, it'd be a bit clunky if every dead person, I'm just like, hang on, hang on, let me do my, <laughs> um, so I will think, I do think it's interesting if we'll sort of like subtly imply as time goes on who her character chooses to do that for, mm. um, versus like, well, that person's dead. Yeah. So, or if we'd even get like an actual conversation point, I like Subi being like, Hey, we can't do this with any. <laughs> yeah. So, I don't know. Yeah, I could see that happening. And, you know, she's like a fledgling witch in a lot of ways. So maybe she's right. just trying to like latch onto anything she like recognizes, like, oh, I funeral, like I can do that. Um, yeah, I'm actually curious to see if she does do it for Finley now. Um, hmm. So, I guess, I mean, I don't know how, how worth it is how worth it it is to speculate on what's happening here, but he got his throat slit. The window was broken. I assume that's where we're headed next. They're going to see if they can chase whoever that just was. happened. Yeah. So I guess a chase, um, it does yeah, seem like that they, ha- it's feasible because they heard the glass shatter. So it's not like, you know, Finley was there and this happened two days ago. Um, yeah. I guess, I guess in any case, the sword's probably not there. Presumably, I think so. And so. I guess we, we don't. Was there ever any indi- indication of how long ago he gave the sword to him? Like, did we get any type of time frame? Like, it was because it could have been like three years ago or it could have been like that uh, was last week. I don't think it was that short. I think it was longer term. Um, whether it's like over under a year, I don't know. But I think it's been a while, I think. And is there any chance Finley's dead? because of our party coming like i think we, so too because you know we there's some there's some grander th- yeah conspiracy maybe is not the best word but there's some grander conspiracy happening with this secret and the curses and I you think, know the things being locked away i think it'd be too convenient for like finley's got his you know hands in all these other jars and you know he gets 
there's collateral damage, so to speak. And, it, and coincidentally, the sword is gone. Yeah. Um, I, I do think it makes more sense. Like the party's being tracked in some way and they, this group, whatever it is, got there first. It also would add, add another, it would check another box for the ship attack. Yeah. Of, yeah. That's what I was going to say. Know, we know they're on the ship, you know, let's take care of them there. Right. Um, so, but yeah. Yeah, I could see that. I guess let us know what you guys think. What's what's going on here? And um, you know, what's happening? Yeah. So well, anything else about this episode you want to talk about? Um, no, I think we pretty much covered it. The fox, okay. uh, you know, shaping up to be a great character, you know, oh, yeah. specifically some great moments here. Um I I'm going to be emotionally devastated should anything ever happen to the fox. Britain, you better not. I know. <laughs> Don't even think about it. So, but we know Brennan likes to build those big emotional moments. So, yeah. And I, I don't Fox think, okay, though. I don't think like if the Fox were to die, I don't think she can bring it back. It's not the same as like a, a typical right. familiar, like these witches familiars right. or like actual right. creatures or whatever. Right. Um, so yeah, no, nothing happened to the Fox or we riot. Yeah. All right. Well, like I said, let us know what you guys thought about the episode. And um, I guess we'll be chatting sometime next week about the, it's Tuesday, right? That the next one comes out. Uh, yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, do we do thumbnails for these? Yeah. I mean, we don't have to do anything like specific, but we do at least need a clean, clean photo. Mm -hmm. So we could just be, I mean, we could do whatever, you know, I don't know if you have any ideas. No, <laughs> I can't remember uh, characters' names, dude. I'm so like fried. <laughs> um, uh, da, 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 da. in the drink. I don't know. Let's just do general like excitement, I guess. <laughs> okay, sure. I just decided to audible. Yeah, to I be, I went with you. Be, I felt it, yeah. and yeah, that works. Yeah, we were connected. So, all right. Well, I guess that's it, guys. All right, y'all. Have a good one. Don't forget, uh, we got a Discord, so join us there. We can talk, chat between episodes. We're also on all the social medias, the Pixelist, YouTube, TikTok. You can find us, Twitter. Yeah. Um, have a good weekend, y'all. Yeah. See ya.